if I'm being super honest, I feel like whenever someone walks into a room like a songwriter and they're like, we need to make something that's going to catch on TikTok, it like fully kills it for me. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I'm so excited to talk to you again. It's been so long. It's been so long. How are you doing? I'm still like processing everything that's happened this weekend. It was just like everything still feels like just like not real at all. So it's like doesn't even has nothing's like hit me yet at all. D didn't the hot billboard top 10 thing just happen like a couple of hours yeah, ago? Yeah, like too? literally like four minutes ago. <laughs> like it, it literally just broke. How do you find that? Did someone call you? Um, no, you just like see it on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so crazy. Like I've just like, just some of my biggest um, dreams of all time that I've like manifested in my journal since I was like eight years old happened in the span of like the last four days. Um, and it just like feels like crazy. How do you feel at this moment right now? Um, I'm, I'm still like trying to come down from like the high of it all. Um, like especially something like Saturday Night Live. Um, I was even in shock that they like asked me. So I think while I was there, I was still processing that they had asked me to be on the show. And now I'm processing the fact that I was actually on the show. Um, and it, yeah, it was like, just like I had, I gave my whole crew like a speech at the end and I just started like crying. I was like, this is insane. Like, I can't believe we're here and I get to be around such amazing people and I'm just happy and just, yeah, it feels very surreal. You don't have to get into the specifics. Like, what was the heart of what you said to your crew after a weekend like that? I mean, I'm just very fortunate to be surrounded by really talented and kind people. Um, it's very hard to find, like, a, a, a crew that feels like family. And also, everyone are just, like, really good people. Like, we all have the same morals. We all have the same work ethic. And it's just, like, the vibe of the camp is everything that I've always wanted and looked for in people. Um, and so just to be on stage and to look to your left and right and to be like, this is, I wouldn't want to be on the stage with anyone else. And I wouldn't want to be um, doing this with any other crew. It just, I just feel very fortunate. So take me through it. What happens? They reach out to you and say, hey, do you want to be the musical guest on Saturday Night Live? Yeah. I mean, my, I got a call from my managers and they like, I always know because the three of them are like urgent FaceTime coming through and they're like, give me a text. I'm like, okay. Like usually it's something like good and they called and they were like, holy shit, day, like you're going to be on SNL. And I just started crying. It was just very cool. <laughs> How long ago did you find out? Like literally three weeks ago. Like this oh. is, it's, it's, it's very, everything that's like happening right now is like very living and breathing and alive because it's all happening as it's coming out. Like I, I had just released a, a single that came out this Friday and we had written it. It was the last song we wrote for the album. We wrote it literally two weeks ago. Um, finished the song in 90 minutes, like recorded it, produced it, everything, submitted it to the label and they were like, next single. And it was just like, everything is happening in real time. And it just feels like SNL and then announced this and then announced the tour. And it's very like, as the fans are receiving it, I'm also receiving it too. That makes sense. Are you tired? I can't be tired. How can you be tired when you're like <laughs> so much adrenaline is like going through my veins? Okay. I, I want to talk about the 90 minute song in just a minute, but first, so um, Saturday Night Live is a, a very, one of the last milestones left in an artist's career that we can all sort of qualify as, a, I see you nodding your head, that uh -huh. we can sort of like qualify as an actual milestone, especially for a young artist as, as yourself. Take me through it. What, what does a week look like when you're performing in SNL? So what happened was on was it Sunday or Monday, we recorded, we did the music video for my single, mm -hmm. literally the Sunday or the Monday, I forgot which day it was. Um, so a 12 hour day. And then we had rehearsals on Monday for Billboard Music Awards. And then Tuesday I performed at Billboard Music Awards. Um, and then basically uh, took a red eye that night from LA to New York, went straight to SNL studios and started doing our first rehearsals. Spent like two, three days in New York. And then Saturday came, we did a few run throughs of the show and- So, so the rehearsals are not in, uh, in, at SNL. The rehearsals are in, in like a studio somewhere with your band and with your art, with your dancers and all that kind of stuff. There's a few in a studio and there's a few like at the actual studios. 
What is the experience like of going to SNL as a as a musician? Oh, it's the it's the freakiest thing ever. Like it feels um it just it's one of those moments when you've been watching something your whole life and you're like, "Oh, this is like ev- everything I've been seeing." Um just like the the vibe of the energy. I mean, everyone there is just like the nicest um funniest people ever. So it's just like you you walk in and the the building is just buzzing. Um and then I met Jason Momoa and then we did all those little like first sound cards. We we're like, hi, I'm Tate and did the whole thing for SNL. And it was so freaky. It was crazy. Then you actually have to do it for people who don't know it's Saturday night live, meaning it's <clears throat> Saturday night live, live. Right. It's one of the last truly live things on, on television in, in this era. You're yeah. standing on stage. Um, the first couple of sketches are done. The lights are dark. I can see you smiling. The lights are dark. They're about to go up. Jason Momoa is about to say, "Ladies and gentlemen, Tate McRae." How are you? Mm-hmm. How are you feeling in that moment? Well, it it's like complete chaos backstage, right? It's it's like most insane energy because these skits are happening also in real time with the audience, so they're all reacting, and it's a very reactive process, just seeing how things bounce and if they work, don't work, whatever, and. So backstage is crazy. My dressing room is a little more like zen. I'm trying to like keep it cool. Um, my mom and dad are like going to puke. They're so nervous. Are they there? Did they go with you? My my parents came oh, and on. they were sitting there like would not move out of their couch because they're they're like super superstitious. They're like, we have to sit in the same position that you had in dress rehearsal. And they're like so nervous. I was just like, let's just kill it. Let's just have fun. And um then I kind of just like yeah they're just like Tate come now you have 30 seconds and you like run and it like you would never really know when you're gonna go on and you get on stage and yeah it just like happens so so fast. they so they say ladies and gentlemen Tate McRae the lights turn on and you're you're live uh-huh. are you are, are do you have the presence of mind while you're performing to know hey I'm live right now millions of people are watching me or are you just sort of like in a flow state where you're just like I know I know how to do this thing that I'm doing um I felt like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I think, I mean, obviously I was like so nervous. Um, I mean, your debut performance like on SNL is just a very big one in your career. Um, And I've also only been singing for however, like doing performances for how many years. So of course I was like, oh God, let's like do this. Um, But then I got to, I did Greedy and I was really nervous and I was like, oh, like, I just want to give it my all and whatever. And then I got to grave and I was just standing there and I'm like, I could either be so nervous right now and like do this, or I can just take this in and really tell this story of this song that I wrote and I really believe in. Um, and that's how I felt. Like I, I felt like I was going to cry on stage because I'm like, like I'm performing a song that I wrote myself um, about a really personal situation. And now like, performing on my dream television show. Like there's no chance I'm going to let this moment kind of slip away from me and um, take, they have nerves overtake that. That's a be- beautiful thing. And then, and then it's over and you're okay. We did it. Yeah. And everyone was just like, it was, it was almost everyone's first SNL. So everyone was freaking out at the same time. Did you get to go to the after party? Or did you have to fly right, right out afterwards? We went to the after party and it was the whole like cast crew, everyone. It was so fun. Did you get to tell Lauren that you're Canadian? I did actually. Um, I got to meet him and um, it was the coolest thing ever. I remember like he like knocked on my door to like say hello and everyone in the room, my dad was just like, like we just all just like froze. We're like, no shit. We just met him. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. And two Canadians. I mean, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it was cool. Okay. So let me, let me play the song that um, you can't escape right now it's funny you know i I, I interviewed you what like an hour maybe a a year ago year and a half ago um and then i ran into you at the junos and we had a great great hang there um but and i knew it was going to get really big because it had already gotten really big but i was not prepared for this this what has happened was what has happened with this song just take a listen to this Tate McRae from Calgary, Alberta, and a song called Greedy from her brand new album, Think Later. Tell me about that song. Where, where, um, what's that song about? Where did it come from? 
Um, well, for so long, I have found it impossible to mesh my dancing and my singing. Um, and I was just like, there's, there are two different entities of me. Like I'm a songwriter at like deep down inside and this is my therapy, but then I'm also like, I'm a dancer and I just had no idea how to put those two worlds together. So I was like really going to the studio every day being like, I want to write a song that I can dance to. Um, and I remember I did a week with Ryan Tedder, Amy Allen and Jasper Harris, and we had been doing all these songs and the last day we're like, okay, let's do something totally different. Like just see what we can do in a really short amount of time. Um, and just kind of just like no fucks given. And, um, so then we just like, we started like going back to like old 2000 references, like, um, Nelly Furtado and like old like Britney songs and we're just yeah like, maybe promiscuous Nelly Furtado I can kind of hear that a little bit yeah and so we were like listening to old like Timbaland stuff and um then Ryan was like oh this is so fun like I haven't done this in so long so he starts making this beat and we start just like playing around with the story we're like rapping in the back like throwing out ideas painting this like picture of just like a guy coming up to you at a bar and um it was so fun like we made it so quick and um then I remember Ryan for like a year, not a year, like multiple months, like would try to convince me to release this song. And I was like, Ryan, this is like the scariest song ever. Like, it's so different for me. Like, I was just like scared of it. Like, it just really terrified me. And he was like, Tate, you like have to give it a chance. Um, and then finally, I like came around to it. Like me and my best friend were sitting in my car and he was like, this song is so good, Tate. Like, you have to put it out. And so whatever I put it out on TikTok and stuff. And um, then, yeah, it kind of just like started a whirlwind, like super fast. How, what does that look like? Like, um, when did you start to know that this thing was was starting to take off? I think you, you never really know, like when you first like put something out. Um, but I knew it because I premiered it in Philly, like the night before it got released. And that was like the loudest crowd I've ever experienced. And it was like a, a brand new song that no one knew. And like the first like, dun, 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 like came on and just like, I remember getting the feeling that we all looked at each other and we're like, this is crazy. Like we've never heard a crowd this loud. That, like they um, liked it without ever having heard it before. They just like, yeah. they like, they just, oh wow, that's powerful. It was like a very, and they like heard like there's the little section that I like put out there and knew every single word. And I was just like, this is crazy. And the energy was just like wild. And then we released it the next day and yeah, it was I feel like that's when I kind of was like, oh, this could be something. Um, as a songwriter, I had this conversation with um, Young Gravy not that long ago. Um, I had that con I had this conversation with, man, what's that guy's name? A um, oh, Realist K. And we okay. talked a lot about like getting a lot of success on, on TikTok and mm -hmm. whether you feel as a songwriter a compulsion or something bringing you towards wanting to write something that works on on TikTok, like trying to write the perfect 15 seconds or trying to write the perfect 45 seconds versus trying to write a, a completed kind of piece piece of art. You, to me, are, are someone who's really good at balancing the modern world of, of, of what the music business demands of you now yeah. and, and art and craft. Yeah. How are you with, with that thing? If I'm being super honest, I feel like whenever someone walks into a room like a songwriter and they're like, we need to make something that's going to catch on TikTok, it like fully kills it for me. I'm just like, I think that is the death of art. If we're basing a song off of a 15 second clip, I just don't think that's real music. Like I'm like, I'm not listening to a 15 second clip to feel music the way that I want to feel music. Um, so that's why I will never, ever, ever start something basing it off of one section. I will always write from um, how a song makes me feel in the room, the full song, um, start to finish. I don't care if there's not a 15 second. It's like, if it doesn't feel like a full song to me, it's worthless to me. Um, I think on TikTok, I feel like I've just been doing the same thing since I was like 13. Like I used to write original songs in my bedroom and put lyrics on a screen and then put it out there on YouTube. So it feels like I'm kind of just like doing the same thing that I did when I was 13 in a sense of just like showing, but just in like a smaller section, just, but mostly for me, it's like read these lyrics and realize what I'm saying. Um, if it was a song with like throwaway lyrics, I don't think anyone would really care. Um, 
that much. I, I wouldn't care at least. And I really think that it, when people start talking and strategizing about music like that, it, it does kill it for me. And I, I'm not, a, I'm not the biggest fan, I will say, even though I'm like very on TikTok and, and I love it and I think it's amazing, but in the creation process, you can't, can't think about that. Tate, you know, you have, you have no idea how happy that makes me for a bunch of reasons. One is because I think that um, sometimes older generations, as they try to understand TikTok and, t and, and music that blows up on TikTok, will sometimes make assumptions about the way that it's created. That happened when Justin Bieber put out Yummy. People started like speculating and like, oh, this chorus was meant for blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that, um, the other reason I love what you told me is that I have no doubt that you've seen it. I have no doubt that when someone is sort of like formative for a medium's explosion as a like a music discovery service the way that you have, like. Your, your career and your story is in some ways the story of TikTok as being a place that artists can come from, you know, that true that artists can come from. I have no doubt that people have come to you with money in their pockets going like, we figured it out. I mean, I bet it, I know how to do it. I know how yeah. to do it. We'll give you, we got 14 seconds and we're going to give it to you right now. See, you know, yeah. like I, and, and the fact that you resisted that, you you resist that is, is meaningful to me. Yeah. And I also think also people assume because I'm like a little, um, I mean, I'm a part of Gen Z, like, and I, I am very in that world. Um, people assume that when I'm in a session that I'm just like going to be thinking about that in lyrics and like, oh, what's going to, oh, that's really going to hurt people. And I'm like, like, why are you thinking about it like that? Because I'm just like, if it doesn't do anything to you, it's going to do nothing to them. Why are we thinking about them before us when we're in the room? Um, it will always, always come from if it affects my heart before how I think about people perceiving it. Um, and, and that's also like, I've been reading so many books about um, uh, just creativity recently. And I'm just like, if you ever judge something before it's finished, like there's no chance, you don't even, you're not even giving it a chance to be good. Um, and that's in good ways and bad ways. Um, and so I'm just like, yeah, I, the whole, that whole thing is like very sticky for me. Cause I think as a songwriter, it's very therapeutic and it, it bugs me a little bit when it's, driven from that kind of perspective. I love I, I love hearing it. As a as a non Gen, -Gen Z, as a millennial. Uh-huh. Th that's right. I'm a millennial. Am I an elder millennial? <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, apparently I'm just a millennial. I was born okay. in 87. That's a millennial. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Oh, thank you. Um let, let's talk about one of those songs. Take a listen to this. Tell me a little bit about that song. Um, okay, so yeah, this was the Hail Mary of the album where me and Tedder were uh, writing the track list. I and should point out for people who don't know, Ryan Tedder, um, one of the best producers and most successful producers and songwriters, Beyonce, Paul McCartney, Adele, Taylor, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, Taylor he's Taylor. Ryan Tedder, I can give him so many praise. He's unbelievable and he executive produced this what was album. the name of his band what was the name of that oh one that republic band? one republic good song Huge. good yeah. good big big hits yeah i saw them at the junos one time anyway okay so what do you mean yeah. hail mary pass so me and so the label had basically given us this deadline and it was like a week and a half after i finished my tour and my album got i will be honest like got pushed got pulled back way earlier like i was supposed to release this album way later and um so they're basically like you need to finish this in a week and a half um, so me and Tedder, I get off tour and literally fly straight guy, like get off the plane, go to the studio. I bring out my huge whiteboard and I'm like, let's get to work. Like we have literally a week to finish this album. Um, and so we're writing like the track list. We're like finishing it up and labels like don't do anything else today because, um, you literally just need to finish this album. And so Ryan was like, okay, last thing, let's just go into the next door room and just like try something for 30 minutes and um so we like go in I'm like god like I don't have anything else to write about and so we're just like playing this loop and then all of a sudden he starts singing kisses to my kisses to my and I was like okay and then we just like literally I started writing I'm like you know what I haven't talked about I haven't talked about um the feeling of like uh, how I can like destroy a relationship just like it's like self-sabotage sometimes because of being on tour and focusing on my career and whatever just my 
whatever I do in a relationship. And so the, 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 the lifestyle that you have as a, as a, that, that is required of you as an artist right now is not one that's conducive to having an easy, a comfortable no. relationship with somebody. Not at all. And I know that I know that I am not the greatest at communication. I know that I'm the, not the greatest and very specific, very aware. Um, so we just like start writing this song and I'm just like listing off all these things that I'm like really bad at in a relationship. And, um, it, I don't I don't even know what happened. It felt like it kind of just like God kind of came into the room and just said, here's a song. And um, yeah, we wrote it so quick. How and long start to finish? So we wrote the song in 30 minutes, recorded it and finished it in like 60 to 90. And it was like f- literally fully done. So like in two hours, you went from nothing to the uh, a really big song? To a, f- a full song, like completely finished, completely vocal produced, ad libs, everything. <laughs> That's there's something to that, Tane. It honestly, it it, and that's why I think like, I love the fact that this song wasn't really thought out because it's just a very fun song, and I'm just like, and there was an idea that came into the room, and we took it and we ran with it and just said, let's just make whatever we want with no pressure and no judgment, and um, yeah, and then it came to fruition. Tell me about the the second song you performed on SNL. Okay, so this was a bit of a scary move because I mean, put it like playing an unreleased song on SNL, I feel like is obviously nervous. Like, like no one really, no one knows it, of course. And um, also my fans haven't heard it. Um, but this was one of the records on the album that I am most proud of uh, the lyrics and the story of it and um, how it makes me feel. And I was just like, I really, as much as I love the dancing part and we're going to go out and do a sick dance phase of the full dance break and go that way fully. I need to show people that I'm a songwriter and that this is like a really personal song to me on the album. And I really wanted people to hear it for the first time on a really big moment like that. What What's it about? This is grave. What, what's it about? Um, grave was about a specific like relationship I went through this year. And, um, yeah, it was just, I feel like it was a moment where uh, I had been talking about this relationship all year long. And I was just like, but I love it, but I love it, but I love it. And this was the first time I kind of walked into the studio and I was like, you can only take something so far until there's literally no point of return anymore. And I can only push myself to certain points in a relationship until I like, there's no point saving it. Um, and that's like kind of how I felt in the moment when I wrote that song, I was just like, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing else left to do here. Like I can't keep trying to save something that's already kind of dead. At the same time that you're performing this on Saturday Night Live, and you're aware that you're taking a bit of a risk performing an unreleased song as opposed to like a, you know, one of the big hits or even just another song from the record. Yeah. Um, at the same time that you're aware that you're live on television and this is a very big <laughs> moment for you and this is all happening very quickly. Yeah. Are you having a, a moment on on television where you're processing some of these emotions? right there on TV? Oh yeah. I was, I was going to for sure cry. I, I just like, that was the first time I had sang that song and it, that, I mean, this relationship just meant a lot to me. And so it was like writing, it was really like difficult. And I remember yeah. like after I wrote it, I like went to the car and I was like sobbing my eyes out. Um, and so performing this on TV was really, like I felt like I like ripped my whole heart out and just like, I don't know. It felt really, um, performing was very therapeutic um, because I hadn't talked about it. And then also I felt like I gave it my all a little bit. And so it just, it was, it was very scary, but also like a bit of a release to perform it on such a big moment in my career. And then also say something that I really wanted to say. Well, it's, it's been really uh, amazing to see uh, what's been going on for you over even just the past couple of months, 330 million streams of greedy since That's September 15th. Crazy. Since September 15th. What? Yeah, yeah, no. I don't know. Everything feels very crazy. I just, I keep waking up and being like, this is not real. Like, yeah, just feels very wild. It is real and you, and you deserve it. It's lovely lovely to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for making the time. Thank you so much for taking the time. I was so excited when they said I got to do an interview with you. Oh, come on. You're so, you're so nice. No, I literally, yeah, you're one of my favorite interviewers. So I was pumped. Get out of here. Get out it's of here. You're, you're very, very nice. You're very, it's very Canadian so of you. People, so many people agree on that. I've talked to so many people and they're like, Tom Powers is one of the best. 
Get out of here. Did, did, my, did my aunt tell you to tell you to tell me that? Yeah. You're talking to my aunt? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah um, I am. <laughs> you're talking to my aunt Patsy.